So as my mom said, my name's Matt. This is part of my collection here. Um, this is kind of my hobby. Um, so my plan here is to go through and give you a brief kind of tour through history. We've got stuff here from before 1900 all the way up through Vietnam. And I'll go through, I'll tell you the story behind some of these guys, uh, their uniforms, whatever I know. Um, unfortunately, a lot of their stories have been lost with history. But I'll pass on what I know, and then at the end, like if you have any questions, feel free to ask. If during the presentation I say a term that you're not familiar with, just raise your hand. Let me know what you want me to uh, explain, and I'll go on from there. Um, and then at the end, just I'll have you feel free to come around, look at anything, ask me any more questions that you have. So we'll get started. These first two uniforms that you see up here are pre-1900. This one here was actually manufactured in 1876. I brought these in today to show you kind of like how decorative old uniforms used to be. This one here was a Prussian officer's uniform. So this was in Germany. As you can see, history kind of moth-aided a little bit. But still, to have this, it's very rare. This one over here is out of Canada. This was from the Royal Montreal Guard. And these are woven with thick metal thread. In the first part of the 20th century, we have World War One. I've got two. I've got several World War One uniforms here today. Over here is a canvas one. These were worn. This one specifically was worn by a, a man named Ribnik. And uh, canvas ones were worn during the summer, so they would run around and they'd fight in these long sleeves. Everything I've included with this one for the show: um, a helmet from World War One, a World War One gas mask, cartridge belt. And then this would be their main battle pack. So you'd have to keep your gear in there. You'd have your bed sack over the top. Your bayonet would be mounted to the back. You'd have other various pouches and canteens and stuff that you'd have to carry with you as well. This uniform here was worn by Joe Rupert. He was a Wisconsin veteran. He was part of the 7th Infantry Division, which you can tell from this patch here. His unit was activated in 1917 and went over in 1918. At full divisional strength, they did not see combat, but until the end of uh, 19, uh, 1918, in October, they were involved in the shelling, and that's when they actually developed this patch here and started wearing it. So you can tell from these chevrons here that he was a private and that he served for one year in the military. Um, these guys were actually supposed to attack the Hindenburg Line, the 7th Infantry Division in 1918, but right before that attack occurred was the signing of the armistice, which is where we get our Veterans Day from. It was November 11th of 1918. So then we move on to World War II. We'll start with this gentleman. So this is Carl. Carl was a driver with the 39th Infantry. So you can see from here, from this award here, that he was a driver and mechanic for them. That he uh, he served in the American campaign. He, uh, this is the Army Good Conduct Medal. So it says that during his service he was a good soldier. He never had any disciplinary action. He served in the European, Africa, African, and Middle Eastern theaters. And each one of these little devices on here, these stars, show a campaign that he was involved in. So you look at this, and you can see that he was involved in four additional campaigns beyond the additional additional in, in the European theater of operation. This here shows you that he was a T4, a tech sergeant, second army. And this here, and the for collectors, we call that the ruptured duck. After World War II, the veterans were allowed to sew that onto the uniform so that they could continue wearing their uniform to honor the country and their service. So 
Next step is a Navy uniform. This guy's name was Odd Johnson. So, here's an example of what they all ended up wearing. They had the scarf that they would have tied in a knot around their neck. They'd have the Cracker Jack cover that they'd end up wearing on their head. This is the blues. They also had the whites for in summer. So you got this heavy pea coat. And would you like to try it on? Yep. I'll keep you nice and warm, huh? Mm -hmm. All right. So if you take a look at him, you can see that this ribbon here is for the Pacific and Asiatic theater. So we had a two-front war in World War II. We fought in Europe and in the Pacific. Because he has four stars on here, that shows that with those four stars and that ribbon, he served in five campaigns in the Pacific. Now, if you look over here, this patch shows that he was a mine detector. Or, uh, I'm tired. Sorry, I got a third shift. <laughs> so, um, mine sweeper. He was a mine sweeper. And he was a seaman first class, which you can tell by the rank on the sleeve here. So after that war was over, this ribbon here shows that he was part of the Army of Occupation. So he would have stuck around to um, just kind of make sure that the law was enforced according to what the U.S. government wanted post-war. Okay, take it off. I'll quickly shoot over here. This guy here, that's Carl. So he was with the 36th. That was the uniform I showed you over there that he was a tech sergeant. So that's a picture of him and his wife. These two uniforms belong to the same man. He was serving in the U.S. Army as well. He was a seaman second class when he was in the Navy. He was a private when he was in the Army. His name was Kenneth E. Richmond. He was a Burlington native. So this patch here shows that he was in the Eastern Theater of Operation with headquarters. He was with... He served both in and then in Korea, and he was with the transportation group there. He received the Purple Heart, which means that he was injured while serving. He actually uh, became a disabled American veteran because of that wound, and he went on to serve on various veterans organizations and boards until he finally ended up passing away in 2011. Um, so if you look at these ribbons here, you can see that we've got the Purple Heart. He was part of the Naval Reserve. We've got the World War II Victory Medal, and the full medal is laid out over there in that case as well, if you want to take a look at that. Then uh, we've got the Asian, Asiatic Pacific Campaign. So when he was in the Navy, he served in the Pacific as well. Um, part of the American Campaign Service. And then these other ones down here are various Korean War and American uh, Disabled Veterans. So we'll continue on with World War II for a second here. This gentleman here, is Mr. Robert D. Henderson. He was a pilot in the China, Burma, India area in the Pacific during World War II. So. Here is the Distinguished Flying Cross Medal that he received from the Senate after the war for what he was doing. In China, Burma, and India, the Japanese were entering into Asia and they were trying to just 
take over as much land as possible, kind of like the Germans were in Europe. And uh, there was very high mountain ranges in there, over there, and like 15,000 plus feet high. And these guys had to fly transport planes over those mountains. And back then, airplanes, they weren't really pressurized. So you had to wear special suits, you had to wear air masks, all that stuff. So he was awarded this, uh, this flying cross for his service in being part of that transport corps that helped supply Asia and Australia and the Pacific theater. So the CBI area had a special patch. This one is a bullion, which means that's a wire on thread. So he would have been able to wear something like this on his uniform. And as a pilot, in case he got shot down, one of the pieces of gear that they would wear would be a survival vest. So this is a survival vest. It's got uh, straps in the back that you can tighten it up. And every one of these pouches has something on it. So in here you would have a first aid kit. Over here is your holster for your sidearm. So when you get down, you can fend off uh, anybody coming after you. What was that? Oh yeah, they had a lot of gear they had to carry. But uh, yeah, so you'd have survival maps, everything that you needed to survive and escape and evade in one of these vests. All right. So now we got Korea. This is a Korean War era fatigue. This would have been worn in battle or for work. Um, down here, this is Korean War era pack, combat pack with an entrenching tool. So Korea is called the Forgotten War. Not many people kind of talked about it. It kind of came right after World War II. And it wasn't, you know, there wasn't like the whole gung-ho fight like we had for World War II. We didn't have the animosity at home like we had for Vietnam. So it kind of got forgotten of all the wars. But we still had many people who served both in World War II and Korea, and also even went on to Vietnam sometimes. Right. That takes us to Vietnam. So we'll talk about Staff Sergeant Onisk first. So I was fortunate enough to get this uniform and read a book about him as well. So there was a, I grabbed the wrong card. There was a Colonel Hackworth. Let me double check, make sure I got that name right. Unless I lost it. Okay, so there's a book called Steel My Soldier's Hearts. Steel spelled like steel the iron. And uh, Colonel Hackworth, he came into Vietnam in 69. He took over a battalion, 4th Battalion, 39th Infantry. And uh, it was all draftees. So if you've ever seen a movie kind of like uh, Full Metal Jack or something like that where they run around with peace symbols on their helmets and they're all disheveled, uh, no discipline, that's what he came to. Onus was a staff sergeant with them. His colonel turned them around to one of the best units in Vietnam. So if you look at his awards here, which I really wish I hadn't lost that card because I got all these out here. Um, There we go, good. So yep, he was part of the 39th Infantry Regiment, which you can see from this. The blue discs around the collar tabs and this blue cord here show that he was infantry. This shows that he was a staff sergeant, his rank there. Um, we have the Combat Infantry Badge here, which shows that he saw combat on the front lines. We have a bronze star with three oak leaves. The oak leaves are very similar to the star, so it shows that he received four Bronze Star Awards. Next to that, we have the Air Medal, which being in the Army, it's obviously hard to get an Air Medal. But he managed to get three Air Medals. Then he got an Army Commendation. He got a Purple Heart twice, so he was injured twice while he was over there. And then he got the Army Good Conduct, the National Defense Service. He received two Vietnam Gallantry Crosses and has three Vietnam Service Campaign Awards. And then this one is another Vietnam Campaign Award. These two over here are Presidential Unit Citations. This one is the Army Presidential Unit Citation, and this one is a Vietnam Gallantry Cross Unit Citation. So that means that their unit performed so well that the President actually acknowledged them. Um, 
So this chord over here, it's pretty faded. It's supposed to be red and green. This one was given to their unit for service that that unit's number had done in World War II. This is for the French and the Slaughterless, Cour de Guerre. It's the Cross Award. That was a major French award. The French awarded that unit, or his unit, that award when they fought in World War II. So anybody who's ever in this unit is allowed to wear that. Um, and the book was Steal My Soldiers' Hearts by Colonel David H. Hackworth. Okay. And over here, I have some additional Vietnam stuff. So this man was Hamburg. He was a U.S. He was in the U.S. Marine Corps in Vietnam, and I was fortunate enough to meet his family when I was purchasing the gear and everything. So they got to, I got to see his sword, his medals, everything. The family opted to hold on to that for their own memorabilia, but uh, they sold me the rest of his stuff. Um, so I got kind of a whole layout here of what somebody in Vietnam would end up with. They'd have a pack very similar to what the Korean veterans would have. They'd have special combat boots. They ended up having to put plates in the bottom of the boots because the Vietnamese would actually have what they call punji sticks. They'd make a pit and they'd put bamboo stakes in there and they'd put feces or other things on them so that there's a bacterial load. So if a soldier's walking through the jungle and they step through the pit, it would pierce the rubber soles of these boots. So this is one of the earlier ones where it's just the rubber, it doesn't have the plate in there. But they would end up having to wear those. They'd have the regular fatigues. And then they'd have a flak jacket. He was about five foot eight. He was the first one who raised his hand. I haven't put anything on yet. So this was developed at the end of the Korean War. It was one of the first flak jackets that the U.S. had. A flat jacket is not bulletproof. A flat jacket is there. Yep. Nope. So, if you can hear this, there's plates in there. So, a lot of people don't understand that a bullet isn't just a bullet. If it hits something, that's going to fragment. You're going to have little bits and pieces of everything flying everywhere. Shrapnel. Black. So, this, this piece of body armor, it's got real thick padding on here. And it's got these plates in here to protect the wearer from any of that flak, any of that debris that's going to come at him. So it's not bulletproof by any means. But nice and heavy, huh? Yeah. Can you imagine trekking through the jungle all day with that? Be fun. Yeah. So then to top that off, we got this one is a Vietnam era helmet. This one actually belonged to a Staff Sergeant Strickland. And his last day in Vietnam was 8 9 of 67. So he got out relatively early. So you now get that as well. Now you also have to have a pack like that. You got your boots on, you got your rifle, and any other gear that you have to sustain you for like the next week when you're on patrol. Fun stuff, huh? Oh, yeah. All right. So my brother, as my mom pointed out earlier, is in the U.S. Marine Corps. When he was serving one of his tours of duty, he got to uh, bring his flak gear home. And in his flak gear, they now have a bullet-resistant plate. It's about that thick, and it's made out of a ceramic that's got metal embedded in it to help give it more resistance. His basic flak gear weighed 45 pounds. And that's before you added on extra protection for your sides, your neck, and your groin. And then, you raise your hand. Come on up. This is a. Yeah. There you go. So to add to all that gear, 
because Vietnam was tropical, they often ended up having to wear these. Has anybody seen the Korean War Monument, the memorial? Okay, so you guys are familiar with seeing the guys, the bronze statues where they have these on and they're trekking around. Yep. So. Yeah, not the most comfortable, huh? Yep. And those, uh, because it was so tropical, like the boots and the rubber gear, stuff like this, really didn't survive. Yes. Well, they have monsoon seasons, which is kind of like hurricanes. So yeah, yeah, they they get flooded all the time, stuff like that. The rice paddies, they were always going through rice paddies because that was their main crop. So they would have flooded fields, and yeah, this stuff it would just deteriorate. Yes. So one of the good things is that's the same thing with war. It changes with the light all the time. Back in the day, you couldn't fight at night because you didn't have any lights. You didn't have any way to guide you. It was just you wouldn't fight at night. I mean, when we had the Civil War, that we still didn't really have any means of fighting at night. People would fire blindly. In the uh, Revolutionary War, you still had a fighting technique where people would line up against each other and just fire volleys and hope that they didn't get hit and hope that they hit more of them than you. So yeah, warfare has changed over the decades and the centuries. Yes. Vietnam was more of a war of politics. It was about stopping communism. So it depends on which way you look at it. But for the most part, it was a difficult war because it was led by politics, not necessarily by the soldiers wanting to fight. So there was draftees, there was kind of the hippie era where people were, well, like my mom has a friend who's brother passed away in Vietnam and when he came back they were spitting on his coffin. You know, so it was a very difficult war for the country and there's still kinda some uneasy sentiment about it. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was a it's kinda it's kinda hit and miss. It depends on how long the person served. Like if they uh, if they got out right away, because we had millions of guys in World War II, so when you have a large force and then you don't need a large force, a lot of them will move on. So end up, uh, the GI Bill started like around World War II. So a lot of guys came out and they went to college, stuff like that, on the GI Bill. So at that point, they could put the ruptured duck on, which was... There we go. That. So that would allow them to wear their uniform without being... Because right now, if you're not in the military and you walk around in a military uniform, you can be uh, put in jail for it. There's laws against impersonating uh, government officials and soldiers. So, but that was their way of being able to wear their uniform and show that they had served their country. Um, so, we'll go to another, we're going to step back to World War II here for a second. I've got this grouping here, and there's a little bit more over here. We had allies. Yes. So how do you so I can show you this with each one of them. The uh, can't remember the term now. So an explosive requires a ignition from another source. That would go on here, fuse, there we go. So the fuse would go on there, you'd have the composition, the explosive composition in the head of here. So you remove the explosive composition from here and you remove the, fire, or the, uh, the fuse or you deactivate it by like crushing it or breaking it, depending on what type of fuse it is. So this one's hollow, there's no explosive compound and the fuse is gone. You're saying they throw that, it's go off and they go up in Yes. Because that wouldn't kill. It 
could. If it was close enough, it could. Um, different weaponry has different kill radiuses. So this one here, the blue indicates that's a practice grenade. This one's a U.S. one. It's a pineapple grenade. This one is made to kill. So when this blows up, all these little fragments are supposed to fragment out and be their own projectile. So that one's empty, and this fuse has been punctured, so it's deactivated. Yes? Um, to some degree. They have a bunch of different ones. It all depends on what they're trying to do. Um, you have the ones that look like baseballs. You have ones that look like lemons. You got ones that look like the pineapple. There's all different types. So you can raise your hand. And then this one here is a Japanese Type 99 from World War II. Yep, it's a type of pineapple. So it's a fragmentation grenade. It's made for uh, for more devastation. And you can see the fuse has gone there, and the composition's out of it. No. There. It's only like pound, pound and a half. Oh, yeah. Where was made to kill? Yeah. A lot of the teams, they play video games. Oh, yeah. It's nothing the same. We're talking real stuff where people are maimed and, and uh, wounded for life. Yeah, or yeah. Killed. So in World War One, there was the advent of gas. So there was a lot of people who ended up with long-term, basically, ulcerations. There were people who lost their jaws to machine gun fire, to their lungs. They would lose lung capacity to the mustard gas going in. It basically liquefied their lungs. So, yeah, war is brutal. It's meant to kill. Among your memorabilia, 